Welcome to the IAPB Eye Health and COVID-19 web series. In the web series, we've invited speakers from across different areas of health and development to discuss key topics that are impacting the eye sector during the current pandemic. Today's interview is part of a series of discussions to understand the way the eye health sector is responding to the challenges in operating during the pandemic and adjusting to the new normal. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Joshua Ehrlich and Dr. Hannah Fall for a special uh, uh, focus on uh, some of the more clinical and community health aspects of our COVID considerations. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Ehrlich is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Michigan. His clinical practice is focused on the medical and surgical care of glaucoma, cataracts, and diseases of the anterior segment of the eye. His research in population vision health aims to understand and alleviate the health and disability consequences of, of uh, chronic vision impairments, particularly among older adults. Uh, Dr. Ehrlich serves on the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health and is secretary of the International Agency, uh, sorry, International Society of Geographical and Epidemiological Ophthalmology. He also co-directs the Kellogg Eye Center for International Ophthalmology, which is a member of the IAPB. I next wish to introduce Dr. Hannah Fall for many people uh, who are viewing. She needs no introduction whatsoever. Uh, Dr. Fall has had a remarkable five decade long career from clinical ophthalmology to public health and comprehensive eye care planning in the Gambia, as well as being a broad based consultant to sight savers. And very importantly to us, uh, the first woman president of IEPB who served during 1999 to uh, 2004 and was instrumental in the launching of Vision 2020 in 1999. Running throughout Hannah's career has been the value of making the most of what is available. Uh, the compulsion to be a champion for the health, health as a human right and emphasizing the interdependence of health and its socioeconomic and commercial determinants, the environment, planetary health and technology, which all together connect us into the future and to sustainability. So I'm very delighted to welcome Dr. Hannah Fall and Dr. Joshua Ehrlich for this conversation about a topic that we means a lot to us, considerations of aging for populations in aging populations in this time of COVID. So I'd um, like to start out with a question I think is on all of our minds, because we know you both are, um, are always thinking of your patients or your communities when something strikes and that's what's happened with COVID. So I, I just want to ask each of you, maybe Josh would begin with his response. Um, as COVID began to hit, what were the aspects of providing eye health eye and health care for elders that concerned you most? What kept you up at night? Yeah, thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, that's a really great question. And as COVID hit, both in the United States, where I live and work, as well as in many locations throughout the globe, uh, there was an almost immediate shutdown of daily life as we know it. Uh, and that included provision of clinical eye care in many places, um, at least uh, for most patients. Um, and so really my concerns uh, stemming from that were twofold, my primary concerns. Uh, on the one hand, I was extraordinarily concerned and remain extraordinarily concerned that uh, some individuals with, uh, with the need for eye care for chronic and for acute conditions may be slipping through the cracks, may not be obtaining the eye care that they otherwise would obtain, and that this could have some long-term adverse implications for their vision health. On the other hand, I'm also very concerned about how physical distancing and lockdowns are impacting the day-to-day -day experience of individuals with vision impairments. Um, in many cases, usual adaptations that individuals with low vision may rely on. For example, the ubiquitous use of touch, uh, transportation accessibility, family and friends that people may be used to leaning on for assistance, 
may not be there in all cases uh, in the setting of this pandemic. And so there's a real need, I believe, for us to understand better how individuals with low vision are affected during the pandemic and uh, as a result of the lockdowns and, uh, and social physical distancing measures uh, and what we can do to better support individuals with low vision during these extraordinary times. Thank you, Josh. And Hannah, what keeps you up at night when you think about the aging population and our COVID situation? Well, living in a low income country like Nigeria with, with really weak health systems, a very poor population, largely dependent on an informal revenue generating system. I think the, the aspect which concerned me most was that care for the elderly was going to fall even further down the list of priorities. And that even prior to COVID-19, visual and any other sensory loss and other disabilities were considered the norm of an aging process and accepted by the elderly as well as their families and even those who provided care. So with COVID-19, relations would just obey the, the orders of stay at home for the elderly because they fell into the high risk group and, and continue to keep their elderly at home. And even at the provider end in all the hospitals and the, the health centers, the rule was that non-emergency services would not be sought and was still could not be provided. So that really, you know, bothered me. Uh, secondly, in, in a poor uh, economy like ours, the lockdown also meant a huge limitation on movement. All healthcare which involved any travel, long or short distance, was definitely out. So for eye care, this was particularly worrisome as eye service centers were few and far from most of the population. Worst hit though was the over 70% of our population who lived on daily trade or work, who just had to go out to earn a living. They would never have enough to attend to their bare necessities, let alone buy medications for the elderly with chronic conditions like glaucoma and diabetes mellitus. So even at the risk of COVID-19, they would go out and, and, and to, to make a living and, and become risks even to their stay at home elderly relations. Yes, these are certainly the kinds of issues that pop into mind and that we, we start thinking about how are we going to um, address this. In fact, um, Josh, I'd just like to ask you as a clinician and researcher in this whole field, what has been your focus over the past few weeks and months with COVID in mind? Yeah. Um, so as somebody who takes care of patients on a regular basis and also, uh, and also spends a lot of time thinking about population vision health issues, um, COVID-19 strikes especially close to home, given that most of my research and most of my patients uh, really fall into that camp of older adults. Um, COVID-19, of course, older adults are at higher risk for complications. But on the other hand, older adults are also at higher risk for many eye diseases and for vision loss. And so there's this, there's this real sort of push and pull between balancing risk of COVID-19 and risk of vision loss in the absence of appropriate care. And so my focus really over the past several months now has been on the one hand as a clinician in facilitating as much as possible the delivery of safe patient care. And what safe patient care means for one individual may not necessarily be the same as what it means for another based on both their COVID risk and their risk of vision loss. And so we at my institution developed rather quickly a tiered system of care where based on guidance from local public health officials, we were able to scale up or down and continue to be able to scale up or down the acuity of the patients that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Fortunately, at this point, we've now run from tier one, being the very most acute patients at risk of, of imminent vision loss, all the way to tier four. And so we're seeing almost everybody at this point. And this has, of course, involved the implementation of a host of safety measures, from physical distancing, new sanitization protocols, face coverings, and symptom screening. But it's also involved innovation. And so what we're seeing in our eye center now 
is a real push towards delivery of telehealth when that's possible. Um, telehealth was coming online in our eye center uh, over the past year or so, and there was a very, very quick adoption by both patients and providers and a very quick ramp up, including good integration with our electronic health record to really facilitate these kinds of visits. But on top of that, we've also developed systems of care that, uh, that kind of blend that in-person and telehealth model. For example, for people with glaucoma who need their pressure checked, we now have the opportunity for people to drive by or walk by and receive a quick pressure check outside of the eye center with a, non, with a, uh, with a, with, with a technician um, and no other contact quick pressure check and the values get entered into the electronic health record and then the patient receives a phone call or a video visit with their provider within a couple of days and decisions can be made and really physical distancing is observed for the most part and, uh, and there's a good balance we believe between risk and benefit. I've also been focused however on research. Um, as, I'm, as I've mentioned, uh, I'm quite interested and quite concerned about the potential for the coronavirus pandemic and the, and the the physical distancing and lockdown measures to have an adverse impact on day-to-day -day functioning of particularly older adults with vision impairments, with low vision. And so we've been focused on developing a survey and trying to understand how finances, transportation access, employment, uh, activities of daily living have been affected in those with and without vision impairment particularly in our region of the United States, which has in fact been hit quite hard, unfortunately, by the coronavirus. And so that research is all forthcoming and hopefully will allow us to intervene not only now, but should there be future waves of the coronavirus pandemic to alleviate some of the implications for people who have vision impairment when faced with these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Hannah, you've mentioned to me a few times um, just some of the more personal experiences that you've had with COVID um, through your, your own uh, community. And I wonder if you could share how you've had a heightened awareness of the influence on el elders. Um, I think probably the best way to, to do this is to give a very personal experience. Um, I've got an 80 plus year old uh, relation who stays with me. Uh, she's diabetic. And on top of that, she's also got diabetic retinopathy and has had intral vitral injection. And she was due for an appointment and then COVID-19 hit. Yeah. So the first thing was that she could not be seen. She couldn't go to to keep her appointment because as I mentioned, all non-emergency services had stopped. Secondly, the diabetes the mellitus needed to be controlled. So what we had to do was home care was instituted, her diet timetable was sorted out, her drugs routine was set up, an exercise routine was set up, training in testing of fasting blood sugar, being able to read it, and, and that was not being done by me, it was being done by home help who could be trained to do it. And we had bought the machine and kept at home. And she was also encouraged to recognize symptoms that would mean either the blood sugar was high or it was low. And so it became um, very inclusive where the patient actually took responsibility for her own, her own health and the family was the first line health, health provider. The second thing we had to do was because she couldn't go out and um, there might be a chance that the pharmacies might run out of drugs was to get a three month stock of drugs uh, for her at home. So as I said, it was that transfer of first line responsibility to the patient and the, the family was the immediate, um, for, uh, I would say, advantage, <laughs> if you could look at it that way, of, of COVID-19 um, in, this, in this elderly patient. And I, I think that it may become our new normal. And as health providers, it might be something that we want to invest more and participate more on what happens uh, at, at the home front. 
um, the impact was that if, if she had had to wait, the consequences of the delay in treatment um, maybe is yet to be assessed on, on the vision on her mental health with falling or quality of life. But we tried as much as possible as a family and as a patient to take as much care as possible of this 80 plus year old. The next advantage of that was that because she didn't have to go home, didn't go out because she could stay at home, the risk of also being infected was much, much uh, reduced. Hannah, we, we're seeing big changes in the healthcare environment since COVID, and these will be enduring for quite some time. Um, I wonder how, how have these changes affected what we've put into place from a programmatic perspective? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the development of eye health services in, in, in our country, for instance, is it's just that it's very much still a tertiary level service. So many of the changes that one saw was at the at tertiary center. And, and the main thing they put in place, as I mentioned earlier, was first it was reduced to emergency only. But more interesting were the adaptations that were made to the technology we used and the, and the practice, which aimed at protecting the health providers, the screens, on the slit lamps, the physical distancing was virtu is virtually impossible for ophthalmology. So one had to adopt uh, and adapt whatever we were using to separate the patients uh, from the provider without compromising quality of care. The distance consultation by mobile phone suddenly increased, and I think Josh also mentioned this, but for us, it's mainly mobile phones uh, between the doctors and, and the patients who were familiar um, with, the, with the doctors. And most of those things we had to do were all locally fabricated. And I mean, so the, a lot of innovations and, uh, and new things were being done. Um, the third thing that became quite quite common was a distance interaction. The WhatsApp became very, very popular between providers, groups of providers, between the patients and the doctors, and Zoom meetings increased. So anyone who was averse to the internet or the use of um, that kind of technology just had to, had to learn how to do it. And those in my age group, a few professors and so on, suddenly had to find a way of fitting fitting in. So those changes, if anything, I mean, one could say they had a negative impact on chronic uh, lifelong conditions like uh, glaucoma and diabetes mellitus. Um, but it, again, I, I think the big advantage is that it opened up the minds and allowed everyone to start thinking outside the box on as we say, COVID-19 still hasn't got a vaccine, it still hasn't got treatment, and we still have to be health providers. So it, it really challenges us to think, and I really enjoyed the changes that Josh has uh, put together um, in a developed world, but I think even in the developing countries, we, we can also think outside the box and continue to provide care to our patients. Well, Josh, we'd be interested in hearing from your perspective, how has COVID-19 generated new opportunities for uh, eye health services to align with the needs of aging patients? Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. So I, I really appreciated everything Hannah had to say about how COVID-19 really has forced us to kind of change the way we're delivering care and kind of rethink the way we're doing things. And in many ways, I sort of foresee that COVID-19 may in fact be that catalyst that pushes eye care to really change, uh, at least in the way it's delivered to some populations and to some people, um, and may really force certain innovations that may have otherwise been slower to come about. And so I think that's a really exciting place to be that um, you know, it's sort of a silver lining to the situation that we find ourselves in where COVID-19 may in fact be kind of this harbinger for, for needed change. 
And what I'm referring to really is something that comes out of, in many ways, the World Health Organization's decade on aging. Um, many people have talked about how the coronavirus pandemic is having perhaps an unfortunate impact on the decade on aging and that it's, it's, it's forced us to realign priorities and maybe taken resources away from this initiative. Um, however, I think a more positive uh, perspective on that is that one of the main pushes, one of the main thrusts of the decade on aging is really this, uh, this concept of the delivery of person-centered integrated care. And if you consider some of the innovations that Hannah has spoken about and that we've talked about, uh, delivery of telehealth, delivery of eye care in people's communities, uh, this is really, and even people's homes, this is really part and parcel of integrated patient-centered care. And so in many ways, my hope is that as we emerge from this pandemic, we actually see new and exciting innovations that serve patients better, perhaps, than our older way of delivering care. And we can look to ongoing innovations worldwide that are really quite exciting and really right at kind of on the, on, on the precipice at the moment. And I think it'll be fascinating to see how these things develop over the months and years to come. I was speaking with colleagues in India at the Aravind Eye Hospital who recently mentioned to me that they're seeing many more footfalls at their community vision centers, for example. These are local places where people can receive eye care in their own communities rather than having to travel. Uh, seek care in a larger tertiary care center and perhaps expose themselves to greater coronavirus risk. Um, but at the same time, they're able to receive care close to home, good care close to home. That's facilitated through a telehealth link. At the same time at Aravind, they're also preparing to trial virtual visual field and in-home eye pressure checking. Um, and so these are other innovations that may help individuals with glaucoma to receive care while maintaining physical distancing. And we see this kind of innovation happening the world over. And so I see a lot of excitement and, uh, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of new and, uh, and innovative things coming out of the eye care sector in the months and years to come. And that's a really great place to be and a real positive that hopefully will emerge from everything that we're dealing with. Thank you, thank you. Well, in fact, we've been touching quite a bit on, the, on how the COVID experience is, is uh, raising our awareness of the uh, gaps of care and the requirement uh, for, to radically redesign how we offer services. And I wonder if each of you just had a magic wand, uh, what are examples of improvements you would want to see in the future stemming from this crisis? Hannah? A magic wand, uh, yes, very much so. <laughs> Well, at this point, I would need to absolutely declare my interest in climate action. I mean, it's my big deal. Climate the action, the yes. Climate action. I'm part of the IAPB Climate Action Working Group. So I see the, the COVID-19 as the opportunity to agree on a new normal, uh, which is climate action and planetary health compliance in all the new systems that we think to put in place and even the innovations uh, going forward. What is now called the green uh, recovery that everything that we think of going forward needs to be looked at through the green, the green lens. So if I had a magic wand, I'd just highlight a few of the things that I would, I would love. The distance management. Um, be it in the health services or training or meetings, programming, let's accept that that is here to stay. So all associated innovations, no doubt, will reduce the travel and thus the carbon emissions. So the travel minimization for populations and patients to services or from the providers to the patients. So in that way, we would be climate action compliant, and we would also put all the innovations in place uh, for distance, uh, using distance management. The second magic wand I would like to weigh would be the increasing role of patients. As I mentioned earlier with my 80 year old distance cousin, is that they will probably, if we can, make them the center of care. Josh has mentioned the person-centered care 
person centered care from the patient uh, from the provider's perspective but the person centered care also from the patient's uh, perspective where they take responsibility for their own health and and at a, and for that it will mean a necessary expansion by us the providers in the level and the content of the knowledge and skills that we pass to the patients what role is the teleconsultation what 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 does it mean what will it look like what are the ethics what are the regulations that we have to to think through and because it's going to become become the norm the unique position of care homes uh, for the elderly was really highlighted during this this covid-19 series and uh, and and it, it was accepted i think in the uk and i think probably in the us that yes care homes are for the elderly but they should really be part of the health services and if we don't think of them as part of the health services we we as we failed in covid-19 we will probably continue to fail so it's an it's an opportunity to improve on care for the elderly if the care homes in one way or another uh, became part of the health system a range of, of services being um, being offered um, the elderly as a distinct group with the global coalition for the aging but even in health services we have child health services there's geriatric specialty that i think care for the elderly as a distinct group uh, so that people begin to age gracefully and begin to age productively they are an important group uh, uh, in the population all of these things i've mentioned they all have policy implications which we will need to work through the professional boundaries that we have kept so far will need to be rearranged and managed and technology innovations have to be provided to suit Uh, the stay at home and work from home the frontline workers risks have had major implications and therefore there will be need for changes to the health services most of which we cannot tell at the moment but i think will become more apparent as we progress the the marmot report says that 10% of the population's health status is health services dependent the 90% is dependent on the determinants of health and so if we're going for leaving no one behind mantra and the sdgs which have to do with the quality of life these are real deep and fundamental issues of health as a human right and that we begin to count and recognize the inequities which exist across the world based on the platform of power be it on age on gender disability race minorities poverty so a radical redesign of health and its delivery will be required but not without a seismic shift in the determinants of health i think there is hope um prior to covid-19 the i health world had already begun assessing services its quality and sustainability using the triple bottom line can what we do now be measured by its impacts on people the profits that is made from the health industry and big pharma the impact on the planet and planetary health can we deliberately move from being the problem where the health services contribute to waste to being part of the solution the technology the water and waste management within the eye health services and last point is we we're going to new ways of teaching and learning to ensure that the existing and new generation of health workers are very conscious of these points of the triple bottom line they become compliant to it and they become very very familiar with distance teaching uh, and learning those were my few points if i wave the magic wand well you have a powerful <laughs> magic wand dr hanna fall thank you and and joshua uh, we've had a long uh, series of best wishes from our magic wand do you have any josh that you would like to add well i first like to say i wish hanna could have that magic wand because those are all really really uh, really important uh, 
changes and uh, um, that we'd all love to see in the eye care sector for sure. Um, I would just add that uh, if, I had, if I had this magic wand, I think one area that I'm quite concerned about because I could see things going in either direction in the face of coronavirus is really um, ensuring that we're able to reach hard to reach populations. We've struggled with this for a long, long time. And this relates to people who are hard to reach based on any number of the factors that Hannah raised, whether it's disability, gender, geography, culture. Um, hard to reach populations have been hard to reach and may get harder to reach in the face of coronavirus. Or conversely, with our properly implemented innovations could become easier to reach. And so my hope is, if I could wave this magic wand, uh, that we can in fact harness uh, some of the innovations and exciting uh, developments that are happening in the eye care sector to ensure that now during the coronavirus pandemic, but also moving forward in the months and years and decades to come, that we're able to harness the good things that are coming out of this time in order to do a better job of reaching populations that are difficult to reach for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is all, of course, in addition to the many important, uh, many important wishes that, uh, that Hannah brought up um, with respect to climate action, the triple bottom line, and, uh, and delivering patient-centered care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Well, um, I'd like to take the uh, facilitator prerogative and offer the final words to Dr. Hannah Fall. Uh, Hannah, I'm now drawing from your experience as past president of IEPD and a person who's been extraordinarily important in shaping the organization, past, present, and future. And so my question to you is, how can a membership organization like IAPD play a role in making all this happen? Mm. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, IAPD is uniquely placed. So it's an umbrella organization with a wide, wide variety of members focusing on eye health and vision impairment, uh, disability and inclusion. Uh, its strength has been its depth of knowledge and long experience, especially its power uh, in advocacy at every level. So I, I think as having with all those um, assets, I think the IAPB is, is very, very well placed uh, to look at the new advocacy messages that, that should come out, the new strategies and the new target audiences that, that we have to respond to if we really went down the road of the magic wand, wand thinking. Uh, but more importantly, I think an adaptation of the advocacy packages to the audience, which are maybe going forward are non-health. I mean, we we'll probably have to be engaging more and more non-health audiences, and be it at the global, the regional, down to the to the home level, uh, and the very different ways and varieties and shapes that these messages can come and. and IAPB has had a long experience and I'm sure can rise to, to, to that. Um, it will also have to look at an engagement with uh, and collaboration with new partners. It's already doing that in aging. The Global Coalition of Aging is a very, very good partner, strong partner going forward. Um, groups that deal with human rights, we should be going along with them even animal rights, because we're now talking about transfer of diseases from, I mean, we should engage with groups, maybe not at the same level, but know about, and then also know about us. Social justice, peace, arms control, even climate action, so that we raise, IAPB raises its, its level to sit at global bodies that talk about, decide about, and, and provide finances for these determinants of health. And now it's thinking of global bodies such as the, the, the UN and the Economic Forum. Um, the socioeconomic determinants of health, they are well documented and, and they are increasingly, I think, more important are the commercial determinants of health. All the industry that makes all the things that we use in eye health, we should have sit at the table with them to see if they are making what we want them to make and disposing of them 
properly so that they don't harm them, harm, harm health. Even the farmer and the procurement systems, because the cost of those items and with the very, very poor patients not being able to afford them. So if there's any way we can have an engagement or collaboration with big pharma, with industries, so that the cost of care to the most vulnerable and the poorest does not keep them away from those services. Um, education and human resources for health. IAPB, through its members, invest a lot uh, in human resource development in their programs. And, uh, and, and as we move forward, each of our partners, each of the member organizations would need to embrace, facilitate, and invest in the new normal in teaching and learning, in collaboration with professional colleges and so on. IAPB has a, a real strength in that direction. And man know thyself, Socrates said, and, and IAPB needs to look at an in-house compliance by its members on equity in its governance, in its structure, in distribution, and the way it, they run, run their budgets as well. So moving forward uh, with the many tools that IAPB has used, the use of statements, position papers, guidelines, protocols, and also looking at seizing new methods that are coming in the new normal, the webinars, the YouTube, the virtual meetings, and a working group that might have to sit down and look at what the new normal would mean within IAPB and its work going forward. So those, those are some of the thoughts I have that um, IAPB, I'm sure already, I think they're already uh, working on those things and looking at ways of embracing the future. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for that very comprehensive and cogent call to action. And I think you're right, within the IEPB framework and with among our organizations, there's a tremendous amount of interest in the areas you've just noted. But whatever we're doing, we need to step up our game and we need to do it more conscientiously and efficiently. We've got a much greater task ahead. So I want to thank both of you for participating in this conversation about aging populations in this time of COVID. Uh, Dr. Hannah Fall, Dr. Joshua Ehrlich, very delighted we could have this time together. And uh, I thank everyone for viewing. Oh, I want to remind us that this is part of an ongoing series. Uh, there are multiple uh, different uh, sessions that are um, available uh, for viewing uh, and uh, they're being displayed here so that uh, we can, we can uh, you know, keep, uh, keep alert as web series uh, resources and links come your way. You're welcome, of course, to share any of this material. It's for all of our organizations and anyone, absolutely anyone who you think would benefit from any of this rich information. Uh, these, the series is um, to be available on our website, the IPB website, and through social media. So we look forward to your continuing to tune in to IAPB, continue your activity as a member organization, and we thank you very much. <laughs>